All right, everybody, welcome back to Maddie Moolah. We are going to check out the last three months or so of dividend income. It's been a minute since I did one of these videos, and I think you guys enjoy them, so I'd rather just do it in one big batch instead of having to make three separate videos and rather just give it to you guys up front. I'm gonna to try to get back on to doing these either monthly or quarterly or something of the like. Um, so we're off to a decent start, um, and I would like to preface this video as I'm not getting too aggressive with the dividend income as I once used to. While I did originally kind of see the need for the dividend income in the past, I've more so gone towards a more index style of investing, investing into the S&P 500, just recognizing that the dividends aren't necessarily needed for me today. And so with that, I'd rather just get that dividend income coming from um, the S&P 500, which is gonna be a lot smaller than what it would be investing in individual stocks that are focused around dividend income. And one of the things that I've recognized is, just for me, knowing that I'm gonna be investing likely for the next 10 years or more, um, that the total growth of the portfolio is likely to be better in an investment in an index fund rather than investing in something like an ultra group which might be a more mature business investing in something like a pepsi which might be a mature business now it's not to say that they're not great swing stocks and when the opportunity arises to pick up something at a discount do so right and that's what i did with pepsi you know several years ago it's what i did with johnson and johnson several years ago so i'm up pretty good in those companies alone but I think it's best to potentially just look at an index investment like the S&P 500 that I really balance everything out. And uh, eventually, you know, I hope to get to the point where my investment in the S&P 500 is turning off forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. But to that point, we're not really there as of yet. So um, some more work to be done, but some key things that I have sold is Exxon and a few other companies that were turning out pretty good dividend income in the first quarters of the year. And now we're kind of seeing that kind of pull back slightly, uh, where I think even in May, uh, we saw a negative year over year dividend growth, which is pretty unlikely in the portfolio, as I was chasing 30% or more going from 2021 to 2022, potentially trying to get to 28,000. Uh, I think I've just gone into a route where growth is more of a thing of my style now um, and that's just pretty much the lay of the land as I continue to kind of trim some of these non-core positions and put it into index funds. So let's just go into it. Start off with May. What companies truly paid me out? So we have Caterpillar, about 100 shares of that, $115 payment there. I have some Devo. Um, I'm trying to remember, it's like 600 shares or something like that. So that paid me about 153 bucks. Jeppy, uh, have a pretty significant portion in that. So $325 from that in the month of May. Um, o Realty, I think I have 450 or so shares of this. It pays me about 114, 115 bucks a month. Stag Industrial, $77 a month. I think I have 600 some shares of that. Um, personal opinion, if you are looking for something that has warehouses, associated with it. It could be a great opportunity to pick up something like a stag. It does pay monthly. It's not why I would only invest in it, but if you're looking at warehouse plays and e-commerce fitting into those warehouse plays, it's an opportunity to look forward. Um, did not get a payment in the month of May for XYLD, XYLD, RYLD. So those were left blank. Um, Jeppy, I have also in my IRA as well. Um, Philip Morris I sold out of, so I didn't get anything for that. And that's pretty much it. I don't think I have anything else maybe in the in the very far right, but I don't really keep too much track of those anyway. They're rather, rather still be small. And that 928 bucks for the month of May was coupled with $182 from YouTube income, so that gets me around 1100 bucks for the month. That's not too bad. Um, can't complain with it. Then June did a little bit better. $41 from BlackRock, which hopefully in the future, I need to update this because the forecast is wrong, but hopefully in the future it gets a little bit bigger because it did buy about another share or so. So that should be another 14 bucks a year or something like that. It's not a lot, but it adds up over time. 
Um, Devo, $147. Jeppy with $361. So June was a pretty decent month for Jeppy there. Johnson & Johnson, $233 with my 200 shares of J and J. J. Excuse me, I got the hiccups. O Realty, $115. Bucks. Pepsi, $238. Bucks. I have about 200 shares of that as well. Um, reinvesting all these, of course. $395 in shell and um some of the money i reinvested in shell so uh, i should actually look at what my forward dividend income should be from shell because that should raise because half the money i sold in exxon which was you know circa 30 or thirty five thousand dollars, went to shell so it was a pretty big purchase and then the other half went to the sp 500. so wow this is only 383 measured i don't know so let me do some investigating behind the scenes there. You have RYLD. You got two payments. That payment was supposed to be in May. Actually ended up in early June. And then we had a payment at the end of, um, of June as well. So that ended up being about $63 there. Uh, Stag, another $77 payment on the month. Exxon is my last dividend payment from them. $330. Bucks. Excuse me, man. It's late. Uh, 150 bucks coming from XYLD. Once again, that is the payment for May and June that just showed up in June. Uh, XYLG, about 153 bucks as well. And not much other than Jeppy again in the IRA. And I think that that might honestly be it. So that's, that's pretty much that for the month of June. So 2,600 bucks there coupled with the 180 190 bucks there that ends up being about a $2,800 a month in total for the month of June. And that's pretty typical for the last month of a quarter and ends up being pretty good. Um, keeping in mind that these early numbers also have uh, options trading, which I haven't really gone through and tracked. But uh, you can see in March, it was like 3400 bucks, And I think that that has to do with the fact that BHP also pays um, March and September. And so those are generally pretty big months, just the fact that you have BHP being those extra dividends uh, in there as well. So moving on to July, you have the monthly payers, so expect the Devos, expect the Jeppy. So Devo paid 144, Jeppy paid 439. Phenomenal month in the phenomenal payment month in the month of July for Jeppy. Ultra Group paid 400 bucks, 480 bucks, almost 500 bucks there, um, which was pretty cool. Realty income, 116 bucks there. You have Stag, always paying, uh, 77 bucks there. Spy, 200 bucks. That's pretty good. It's about half a share of Spy at the moment. So I'm hoping to double that amount. Um, so I think I have almost 230 shares of Spy. would love to get it closer to 500, and that would be able to get me about a share of Spy per quarter. And that would end up really starting to snowball some things. So that'd be pretty cool. So... I wouldn't be surprised in the few months or so if I do continue to consolidate some positions, if that ends up going up. Then you have RYLD, 33 bucks there, 115, 116 from uh, Realty Income, 77 bucks from Stag, yep, said that. Um, then you have the 77 bucks, almost 78 bucks from XYLD and XYLG. I think I might simplify this as well, um, going from XYLD and RYLD and Maybe take some of that money, put it in the SPY, and maybe take some of that money and put it into XYLG. I'm a more of a fan of XYLG, yes. I know it costs more in terms of the expense ratio than you guys might like, but at the same time, it's only written cover calls on half the position of SPY that they invested. So it's not necessarily as limiting as an XYLD. Um, in terms of the cover calls only being like a 1% or 1.5% above um, the money, you're talking about only half the position being covered under the cover calls. And so it allows for, you know, 50% of the SPY shares to kind of run without any sort of cap to them. So that ends up allowing you to have a little bit more equity value growth. Now, of course, I still don't need the dividends, but uh, that's neither here nor there. For some reason, man, I just love dividends. So uh, 123, 124 bucks. I hope I'm not making you guys yawn in the video. Um, sorry, I just wanted to knock this one out. I was like in the midst of doing it and had the opportunity. They have WP Carry for 106 bucks. And I think that that's pretty much it. Um, we have some money here and there, 50 bucks here or there. 
nothing too crazy going in uh, to that. So that ends up being about two thousand dollars. Coupling that with the two the two hundred fifty bucks that I got for the month of July for YouTube, it's about twenty two hundred bucks altogether. It's about fifty five fifty six hundred bucks for the dividends, and if you combine the YouTube income in there as well, it's about sixty two hundred bucks. Not bad. You can't complain with that. Some pretty good payments in here, but this is what I was talking about earlier. So these graphics here to the left, it's kind of the dividends by month. You can see it's kind of growing up. This green are uh, the 2022 months, but you can see that we're kind of forecasting them to kind of come down a little bit um, in the latter half of the year. But what we are seeing is June increase. We saw May kind of flat, if not slightly down, which we'll show in a second. We'll see July up. Man. Oh, man. I'm oh, sorry, y'all. Um, so, yeah. Year over year, we saw 10% down in the month of May. We went from about $1,000 to nine twenty-eight, so that's your 10% there. Uh, June, we're up 8.6%, so we were at 2400 We're up to 2600 almost 40 bucks now. So that's at 8.6%. And you have 34% increase year over year in the month of July. So we went from 1500 bucks to 2000 bucks. So that's pretty, pretty good there, a 34% increase. But like I said, it's a small increase from where we were. We were up 60% year over year in 2020. So from 2019 to 2020, we increased 60%. 2020 to 2021, we increased 51%. And we're only on, really on track right now for about a 5 6% increase um, year over year uh, in 2022. So it's not very good, but uh, you can't complain with it also. But you can see we were kind of getting there in the first few months of the year, but I've kind of taken my foot off the gas pedal and rearranged some money, more specifically like Exxon. That was a pretty good dividend pair, man. So some um, putting some of that into Shell and putting that in the S&P 500 really takes away a good amount um, in there. So we'll see what ends up happening, but just overall, you're seeing a steady downtrend. Let me see if I can include... Um, the I'll do it a little bit later off screen, but uh, wanted to share that with you guys. I think it's pretty cool. Some of you guys have been following me since I was truly in the dividend days, but I'd like to take an opportunity to tell people, you know, hey, if you have the opportunity to potentially look and um, be a little bit more about specifically um, your portfolio and understanding what your objectives are and your time horizon and what you're really trying to do with your investments, you might come to the same conclusion as me. I mean, I was investing heavily into dividends because in 2014, 2013, you know, I was in a very volatile industry. I work in oil and gas. And um, with that, you saw the volatility and the need for some sort of fallback plan, whether it was dividends or something of the like, to generate some sort of income. So that was my immediate draw to the dividends aspect of the business, um, or say investing. And what I've since seen is I've underperformed the market because I was chasing yields very early on in my investment career, which I know and I see a lot of other people do. So I call them out for it. And what I've recognized is that I probably would have just under overperformed, not overperformed, but matched the market at least if I had just had index funds. And I'd have probably several, several hundred thousand dollars more than I do today just based off that mistake alone. Not saying it's the right way for everybody. But what I recognize is a lot of people fall in the same trap as I do. Um, you know, then I kind of fall more in the line of just instead of chasing yield, chasing dividend growth investors, and those do well over time. And I agree, depending on what companies you pick up, they end up doing really, really well over time. Um, you know, Dr. Pepper is a good example. You have a lot of great examples out there. Um, but at the end of the day, it requires a lot of time and effort. And what I've recognized for me is the way that my brain works, side hustles and stuff work, um, instead of me trying to churn on something that I can really not control all too much, what I can control is my side hustles. What I can control is making that additional income and putting it into the market. So let's say I was able to get an additional 5% or something like that year over year on my investments. What's probably more prudent of me to be doing is just making more money in general, where I've made dozens of thousands of dollars by side hustling 
and then putting it in the stock market. Instead, I'd be trying to churn and churn and churn to make 5% more in my entire portfolio. It could be a pretty good significant sum of money. But over time, you know, that time could be used elsewhere to develop a business or something that might be able to grow long term with me, um, just like an investment portfolio would be as well. But um, it would be very difficult to beat the market every year by 5%. Um, being able to get a 14, 15% annualized return is pretty significant. And so most of the time and what I saw was I was underperforming the market more, more likely. And I kind of said at the time, you know, I was right when I was saying this for my own personal investment thesis, it's okay if I don't beat the market because I'm worried about the dividends. And that was true for quite some time. But now I've kind of matured into the portfolio and been like, crap, where would I have been in terms of the hundreds of thousands of dollars that I've likely lost? Um, by underperforming the market. And at the time, it didn't matter. But now the fact that I have, you know, $20,000 a year coming in at dividends, I'm in a different spot. And so, um, you know, I have a decent job. I have the ability to, to make side hustle income if I need it. I have this pretty decent nest egg now. So anyway, it just kind of gives you some retrospect uh, from my personal, you know, investment journey thus far to understand how you might be able to apply it to yours. And that's really the hope, I'm not trying to direct you into some sort of investment thesis or anything of the like. It's just me documenting my progress. And I hope that you guys get some sort of benefit from understanding, hey, this is Matt. He's an engineer, does relatively well. He was in dividends and actually was in penny stocks at one point very early on. Then dividends that were chasing yield. Then he was in dividend growth. And now he's kind of in this index, more hands off, you know, somewhat speculative um, investment nature with a very small portion of his portfolio um, and he's trying to basically leave a lot of his money investing into just matching the market um, that could mean something to you it might not it might say Matt's an idiot and I need to day trade 24 7 hey if your investment thesis works out for that and your risk tolerance works out for that then I'd say go for it um, but I find that most people are lying to themselves when they say they don't care about putting very little effort into the uh, markets and also getting decent returns, I think the best cost for your buck is just putting in index funds over the long term. But, uh, you know, some people like to try their hands at picking individual stocks. They don't care if they underperform the market um, because they want dividends and they want something or they're just lying to themselves. And I think I was in that camp for a little bit. I was focusing too much on dividends and I didn't think about the long term consequences. Um, but I've also been fortunate right over the past eight nine years to retain a job in a very volatile market as well as we've seen oil and gas have a lot of volatility since 2013 2014 since i entered the workforce so things could have gone otherwise and uh, i would have been very fortunate to have that a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks a month to kind of keep me going um but in retrospect in that case i haven't needed it and now i'm closer to two thousand dollars a month in dividend income i still don't need it so um, and if I need that 2000, I can just side hustle or something like that and figure out a way to get it. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. I think it's pretty cool to be able to share this stuff with you guys. So I like to do it when I have the opportunity. So if I don't see you guys, um, on the next one, then I don't know what I'm saying, man, but I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll talk to you guys on the next one. Cheers.